There's nothing quite like the 80s action movie genre. Big muscle men with huge guns mowing down unknown numbers of enemies in order to confront some larger-than-life villain, typically with a foreign accent, in order to get the girl and save the day. They're as enjoyable as they are simple. Sometimes you just want to see things explode. In the pantheon of great action movies, there's one that stands out for many reasons. 1988's Die Hard. I love Die Hard, and like many people, my Christmas doesn't begin until I see Bruce Willis appear at the front door of Nakatomi Plaza. There have been tons of different analysis about how the movie portrays McLean as an underdog, in sharp contrast to his action star peers, but I want to talk about something a little different today. Let's talk about how Die Hard is a video game. Yippee -ki -yay, motherfucker. No, I'm not talking about the Die Hard trilogy on PS1, or any other video game that spawned from the franchise. We're talking about the original movie. It's no secret that Die Hard is an extremely influential film. It's a clever take on a genre that by 1988 was floundering in repetitive sequels, and while Die Hard would later fall into the same trap, the original movie was something special. There's a reason why there are so many references to the original film in pop culture, and one place where its influence is felt clearly is in video games, and I'd argue there's a very good reason for that. Everything about Die Hard, from its plot, its physical structure, and its portrayal of the various characters, would later become common use in game design. Die Hard is a simple enough story. John McClane visits his estranged wife in Los Angeles on Christmas Eve, at her job in Nakatomi Plaza. Terrorists take control of the building, and John has to find a way to stop their scheme by using the very few resources he has on hand. This film is one of the greatest examples of setup and payoff. Almost everything that happens in the film has a purpose. It's like Chekhov's gun on steroids. In the beginning, a man tells McClane a trick about relaxing after a flight by taking your shoes off and clenching your toes, which is why he's caught barefoot during the terrorist takeover. When Holly looks at the photo of her family and becomes sad, she puts it down, so when Hans later uses her office as a base of operations, he doesn't realize her relation to John. There are tons of moments like this in the film, and it's one of the major reasons why it's so fun to rewatch. Most importantly, this also applies to McLean's equipment. Whenever John manages to find something useful, the movie takes the time to highlight it, like when he searches Tony's bag and body after killing him. John McClane has an inventory in this movie that he collects and uses constantly. Each little piece that he picks up becomes useful at some point or another. The movie wants you to know just how resourceful McClane has to be, and just how unprepared he was. He starts the terrorist takeover with a single pistol, and while he collects things like machine guns and plastic explosives from the terrorists, he often has to sacrifice them just to survive and by the end of the movie, he's back to only having his trusty pistol. In the final scene, he even counts the bullets he has left, knowing he needs to make every shot count. John McClane is the ultimate survivor. He's scrappy and resourceful, but Nakatomi Plaza is an unforgiving building. Come out to the coast, we'll get together, have a few laughs. <laughs> Arguably the most video game aspect of this movie beyond McLean's inventory is Nakatomi Plaza itself. Despite the structure's looming stature, the film is actually extremely claustrophobic, as it only takes place across several floors, and each space is unique. You've got the main floor where the hostages are being held, the floors that are under construction, the computer room, Mr. Takagi's office, and finally, the rooftop. Each of these floors has their own unique style, and serves a specific purpose in the movie. However, what makes this building especially claustrophobic are the connecting parts. The elevator shafts, engineer hallways, and of course, the air vents. The space of Die Hard is so important because it emphasizes McLean's position as an outsider. The terrorists are shown to know the layout of the building, which means they're constantly at an advantage. Once the takeover begins, when John is at his most panicked, he spends a lot of his time going from floor to floor, analyzing each place and figuring out his best option for hiding out. Along the way, he picks up different details about the terrorists' plan and tries to alert the authorities as best he can. As the movie continues, John starts to get his bearings. My favorite example of how the different floors 
doors are used is in the shootout with Carol. McLean decides to find his way to the roof in hopes that he can radio for help. After climbing out of the elevator shaft, he spots a nude poster on the wall before making his way upstairs. When Carol and the other terrorists arrive, John is forced to jump off the roof onto a lower floor, followed by a trip through a fan and down another ladder. After almost losing everything and finding himself in an unfamiliar room, he steps out to find that same nude poster, which immediately tells him where he is amidst the similar cement hallways. This is without even getting into how the building physically damages John, such as the iconic glass feet moment. Nakatomi Plaza is a neutral figure in this movie. While it is the source of a lot of John's pain, it also protects and aids him in equal measure. The elevators are arguably one of John's most important assets, as both a method of taunting the terrorists and learning more about their plans, along with actively disrupting them. Geronimo, motherfucker. So by now you're probably thinking, okay, Die Hard is a good movie, we get that. How are you going to tie this into video games? Well, if my talk of inventory lighters, counting ammo, and hostile buildings sounds familiar, it might have something to do with a certain important video game franchise created by a well-known cinephile. It's remarkable how similar Metal Gear Solid 1 and Die Hard are from a surface level. Terrorists take over a facility and make absurd demands to hide their ulterior motives. One man procures weapons and tools on site to combat them. He barely manages to escape after losing almost everything and killing the leader of the terrorists. And he lives happily ever after. Kind of. While this is a reductive way of looking at both works, it isn't really just a surface level comparison. It's no secret that Kojima uses films for inspiration in his games. I mean, in his most recent game, he literally created a character whose codename is Die Hardman, real name John Blake McLean. I think that says enough about his love for this film. The main difference between Solid Snake and the real John McClane is in something I highlighted earlier, preparedness. McClane and Snake are both outsiders in an unfamiliar building. However, the difference is that Snake was sent purposefully. Ultimately, this doesn't really matter much since Snake arrives at Shadow Moses with no real weapons. You'd think the locations would be another primary difference since Shadow Moses is a sprawling facility in contrast to Nakatomi Plaza's verticality, but that's not really the case. Most of MGS1 is spent inside concrete hallways, crawling through vents, and the few sections that take place outside are still fairly claustrophobic compared to other games. When you look even deeper, you start to see how similar they really are. Snake and McLean both share a humorous tone despite their life-threatening situations, but they aren't just macho action movie gunslingers. The way the player learns the different areas of Shadow Moses and collects weapons and ammo along the way is very similar to the way McLean moves around Nakatomi. Much like the rooftop shootout that I mentioned earlier, there are multiple moments in MGS1 that mirror this, the most obvious for me being after the torture segment. A bit after the midway point, Snake has to walk from one side of the facility to the other to retrieve a sniper rifle to fight Sniper Wolf, and after beating her, the player is knocked out and brought to the interrogation room. Here, Ocelot tortures Snake, and afterwards he's thrown in a jail cell. At this point, the player has no real idea of where they are, until they find their way out of the cell and realize they're back where you first met Meryl at the beginning of the game. At this point, you've been playing the game for a few hours, so you should be able to immediately regain your bearings and continue on your way to the next objective. One aspect I've neglected to really mention thus far is the villains, Gruber and his gang of terrorists. I would say there are three important members of this group, the leader Hans, the hot-blooded Carl, and the witty hacker Theo. Honestly, it really wouldn't take much to transfer these characters over to a video game. The only thing that separates them from Foxhound is that they're, well, normal humans. What kind of terrorists are you? <laughs> Who said we were terrorists? One of the things I noticed while rewatching the movie recently was just how similar Liquid Snake and Carol look, and I would be willing to consider it a coincidence if they didn't both reappear at the end to get one final shot in after the heroes think they're dead. There are tons of moments where the structure of MGS1 and Die Hard are very similar. They both involve an important scene with a helicopter on the roof, which leads to the protagonist having to abseil down the side of an exploding building. They both have the protagonist beaten and bruised by the end with little to no resources left, and even the radio 
calls with Al on the outside are analogous to Metal Gear's codec calls. Another aspect of Die Hard that creeps its way into MGS is McLean's lack of support. In the movie, John is almost fighting on two fronts, one against the terrorists, and another against the incompetence of the LAPD and the FBI. While in Die Hard, this is due to bureaucratic dick swinging and is mostly played for laughs, MGS takes it far more seriously, when the Secretary of Defense prepares to nuke Shadow Moses, essentially covering up the entire operation and killing any survivors, including Snake. I could go on and on about the similarities, but the point is, Die Hard's structure, themes, and characters can be seen across all kinds of video games, not just Metal Gear. There's a reason why Samus starts every Metroid game with only her base attacks. It makes wandering around desolate facilities and planets teeming with monsters a lot more tense when you have very few methods of protecting yourself. Video games love scrappy underdog stories, and with good reason. They're much easier to relate to. While Bruce Willis isn't exactly your average Joe, part of the reason Die Hard is so good is his relatability. He's a human character with human flaws, trying his best to fight his way out of a situation he was woefully unprepared for. It's much easier to relate to John McClane than, say, any of Arnie's characters. That's something video games do best, putting the player in the shoes of the protagonist, experiencing their struggles and triumphs personally. So, next time somebody asks you what the best video game movie is, you tell them there's only one answer. You never said you had a gun, you prick.